Understanding creation, where do humans come from? Um, we've been reviewing the book Understanding Creation. Um, it's edited by James Gibson and Umberto Rossi. There are 20 chapters which are intended to be standalone, and they allowed 1,800 to 2,400 words, which if you've uh, done some writing, you know that, that especially for the topics involved, that's really tight constraints. This week, we'll be discussing Ronnie Nalen's chapter, uh, Where Do Humans Come From? Uh, for those of you who don't know Ronnie Nalen, he is at uh, GRI. He got his uh, education at the University of Padova, where he got a PhD in Earth Sciences. And uh, at the, uh, from 2007 on, he's been working at the Geoscience Research Institute. And he's also adjunct professor of geology at Loma Linda here. And uh, he particularly looks at sedimentology of non-tropical carbonates, especially from the Mediterranean area, which is where he's from, of course, and sequence stratigraphy of shallow marine sedimentary deposits. He's published several articles on these journals. His personal spiritual journey, a journey has gradually led him to value faith and science as sources of knowledge and understanding in life. I'm not sure exactly what that last sentence means, but... Um, uh, if I can kind of summarize or set the uh, stage for where we go through the, the chapter, Ronnie Nalen, uh, I think, does a good job of summarizing the data, mostly from the standard literature. Uh, so he's not going to deal with a lot of controversy. He discusses Australopithecines and various Homo species. And I put that in quotes because we're going to see that he raises some interesting questions about that. And briefly, the difficulties with making the distinctions between some of these. He omits the controversial history of the field. So if you're looking for Piltdown Man or Nebraska Man or Java Man or Peking Man, you're not going to find him here. Uh, choosing to state, uh, discuss the state of the art at present. And I, I think this is... Um, good from a number of standpoints, uh, one of them which is that many of the people who will be asking these questions haven't a clue as to who Nebraska man is, for example. Uh, he briefly relates personality personally to the subject, and at the end he gives a creationist perspective, which I think is a valuable one. So here is Ronnie Nalen's uh, uh, treatment of the subject. The creationist understanding of scripture where humans are the product of divine act of special creation conflicts. And then this is probably one of the sharpest conflicts with the evolutionary hypothesis of descent with modification from ancestral primates. The chapter reviews and discusses the fossil uh, evidence relating to human origins. Now, he raises the question, how do you decide what's human? And I think that's important. And um, and he actually has a reference that uh, makes a pretty good case to define a simple approach uh, on the basis of anatomical characteristics. But um, every living species has variability of morphological traits, and that's true for us as well as for other people. When compared with other extant primate species, modern human skeletal metrics appear to be rather homogeneous, which is kind of interesting to think about. Uh, in other words, there's a lot more variation in some of the other apes than there are in humans. Uh, certain fossils fall outside this limited modern spectrum of variability, and uh, there is no clear consensus on the diagnostic criteria that should determine whether they should be considered human or not. Now, we'll come back to that point at the very end when I do my own summary. A practical approach is to place a given fossil in the Homo category, uh, Homo sapiens being our particular species, when body mass and proportions, dental dimensions, and skeletal adaptation for bipedality show greater similarity to modern humans than to Australopithecine fossils a group of hominids whose remains were first discovered in Africa early in the last century, um, and which are generally not considered human, and 
at the very end you'll see partly why. Other traits often considered relevant in defining humanity are brain dimensions, tool making ability, and indications of social and symbolic behavior. Of course, um, unless you find the tools, and if they were made out of wood, you wouldn't find them more than likely. Uh, and unless you find other evidences, it's going to be pretty hard to, to judge social and symbolic behavior. Did humans evolve from Australopithecines? And that's the first question that uh, uh, he, he raises. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to note that virtually nobody nowadays claims that humans evolved directly from uh, chimpanzees. First of all, they should have had a common ancestor. Secondly, we don't know what that ancestor was. Um, in the evolutionary hypothesis, Australopithecus is considered the form from which Homo stemmed. Its remains are found in Pliocene deposits that lie beneath those containing Homo fossils. Now this is the standard story. The anatomy of Australopithecus reveals traits that today can be only found in humans. However, many characteristics clearly distinguish Australopithecus from Homo. These include, among others, a small, smaller body mass, a small brain size. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, less, about a third of what uh, modern humans have. Um, a greater length of the forearm relative to the upper arm. Um, a funnel-shaped chest and relatively long and curved fingers. And uh, again, he's citing the standard literature. Discoveries in reach, recent decades have increased the range of variability observed in Australopithecine fossils. Further complications emerged from the discoverer of Ardipithecus ramidus in layers beneath those containing Australopithecus remains, uh, presumably older. Despite its spatial and temporal proxi proximity to Australopithecus, Ardipithecus ram ramidus is remarkably different and again, he has a reference for that. On the other hand, layers above the strat stratigraphic range of Australopithecus yield remains assigned, assigned to Homo, as well as fossils of hominids similar to Australopithecus, only with more robust skeletal features. The genus Paranthropus. Uh, if both forms derive from Australopithecus, the this continuity between Homo and Australopithecus becomes even more apparent when compared to the similarity between Australopithecus and Paranthropus. In other words, it looks like Australopithecines kept on going for a while after humans were developed, if that's how the scenario is supposed to be working. In conclusion, the fossil evidence used to argue in favor of the evolutionary relationship between Homo and other extinct hominid forms is far from compelling and remains unresolved, particularly in the light of an as yet incomplete Pliocene hominid fossil record. We don't really know from the fossil record whether we're descended from Australopithecines or not, and there's no really good convincing evidence that it actually happened. Does Homo habilis link Australopithecines and humans? Established in the 1960s, Homo habilis is a species based mostly on fossil remains that have been discovered in eastern Africa. These fossils show a great deal of morphological variation that many researchers believe the species actually contain two separate forms, one smaller sized and one larger. Cranial capacity estimates vary between 500 and 750 cubic centimeters, slightly larger than the average of 400 to 550 for Australopithecines. Foot bone studies suggest that Homo habilis was a terrestrial biped, but its arm bone proportions were ape-like. Some authors have concluded that Homo habilis is a derived form of Australopithecine rather than part of the Homo genus. So it depends on who you're listening to. Maybe they're in between, maybe they're not. And again, he's citing standard uh, literature. 
Now the non-modern looking humans, he's going to be talking about three different kinds. Uh, some fossils share enough similarities with anatomically modern humans to be considered part of the genus Homo, besides the Homo habilis that we talked about earlier. However, they display traits distinctive enough to be described as different species. The following section discuss the main types of non-modern looking human fossils. Homo erectus. This is a species based, this species is based on discoveries made in Indonesia, China, Africa, and Western Eurasia. Distinctive features of Homo erectus include an elongated and low cranial vault. That is it's like it's been squashed down and pushed back. Robust brow ridges. A sharp angle between the base and the posterior part of the cranium and an absolute brain size, about a thousand centimeters smaller than that of uh, anatomically modern humans, which you'll remember is about 1400 plus or minus, probably 200. So it's small, it's not that small. Postcranial remains, that's, that is to say, uh, skeletal elements other than the skull, and well-preserved footprint trails indicate essentially modern body proportions and movement or locomotion. Estimated height and body mass for some Homo erectus specimens is comparable to average anatomically modern humans, but other specimens show very diminutive size. And uh, again, there's the reference there. Um, you'll notice that uh, one of the references here is uh, leaky. I believe that's Richard Leakey. Um, among the enigmas surrounding the origin of Homo erectus and its sudden appearance, its co-occurrence with supposed, uh, its morphological discontinuity, and its co-occurrence with supposed ancestral forms. Another puzzle is that from the very beginning, Homo erectus presents a wide geographic distribution from Africa to Southeast Asia. Just kind of appears everywhere. This has led some to question the commonly accepted scenario of an African origin of Homo erectus with subsequent dispersal to Asia. These researchers support the opposite view, origin in Asia and successive dispersal to Africa. And uh, there the, uh, there's a reference in, again in the standard literature. Furthermore, anthropologists disagree about the fate of Homo erectus. Some argue that modern Asians preserve traits typical of Homo erectus, suggesting regional continuity between uh, anatomically modern humans and Homo erectus forms. Did they perhaps intermarry? Others propose that Asian Homo erectus was a long-lived peripheral side branch that eventually went extinct, presumably without intermarrying with modern humans and uh, therefore passing on traits. <clears throat> so you can get anybody, someone who argues either way. Homo heidelbergensis. Homo erectus fossils disappeared from Africa and Europe toward the end of the lower Pleistocene. Here they are succeeded by mid-Pleistocene fossils showing marked increase in cranial capacity. These specimens have been grouped in the Homo heidelbergensis species seen as an African-European form derived from Homo erectus and ancestral to both Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans. And again, standard reference. Fossil remains found in the upper mid Pleistocene of China are very similar to the classic African European Homo heidelbergensis specimens. Some authors suggest that Chinese material in indicates a late migration to the Far East by Heidelbergensis. However, supporters of the regional continuity view, where fossils from the same region are apparently from different species, uh, that are apparently from different species, show similarities, uh, these people prefer to interpret the Chinese fossils to be evidence for local continuous gradation from Homo erectus to anatomically modern humans. So are they Heidelbergensis or are they not? It depends on how you view the theory. 
And again, there's a couple of references there. Neanderthals, uh, Homo neanderthalensis. Neanderthal, or actually Neanderthal, if you're in Germany. Fossils are found uh, only in Europe and Western Asia. Uh, the note notes that they may have ranged all as, uh, as far as southern Siberia. They show overall similarity to anatomically modern humans, but have a more re robust skeletal structure and highly distinctive skull features. Um, and he has a reference for that. Remains with a complete set of Neanderthal traits begins to occur in the upper Pleistocene, but Neanderthal-like characteristics are already apparent in mid-Pleistocene European fossil, hominid fossils. And uh, he gives a couple of examples. Uh, uh, one that sounds like it's probably from uh, uh, England and one from, that's definitely from Spain. Neanderthals had bodily, body proportions similar to those of anatomically modern humans living in, living in extremely cold climates, for example, Eskimos. However, the idea that Neanderthal skeletal anatomy is a result of climate adaptation has re recently been challenged. Interestingly, the Mediterranean region with its mild climate seems to have been their favorite residence. Although my own comment on that would be take that with a grain of salt because they're, of course, living mostly in the Pleistocene, which is considered an ice age, and it may very well have been cooler in the Mediterranean region uh, at that time than it is now. <coughs> Neanderthals disappear from the fossil record in the uppermost Pleistocene. Some think their extinction was due to their replacement by new anatomically modern human migrants. Others propose that Neanderthals admixed, at least in part, with the expanding anatomically modern human group. Analysis of mitochondrial DNA extracted from Neanderthal bones has revealed sequences that differ from the mitochondrial DNA of both modern and fossil anatomically modern humans. Nevertheless, uh, since these are not ones that uh, can easily mix in, your, uh, you get your, descend uh, your uh, gene, genome 98% uh, or so uh, from your mother and nobody else. Um, these differences cannot completely rule out that the Neanderthals contributed to the human gene pool. That's my typo there. In fact, a recent study of the Neanderthal genome seems to indicate that the DNA of present-day human populations carries segments derived from Neanderthals. So there's apparently an actual reference that says that. The fossil record of anatomically modern humans. Anatomically modern humans, if in case you are curious, um, are distinguished on the basis of certain traits. A skull with globular rather than elongated shape. A face that does not project forward, is more or less flat with the forehead. A little development of brow ridges. Um, most of us don't have much right in there in, in terms of bone. A well-defined chin and smaller dental dimensions. The earliest fossils showing this combination of traits come from East Africa. However, it's important to note that other contemporaneous specimens from the same localities do not look so modern. Uh, it is only at a higher stratigraphic level, usually dated around 45,000 years, that anatomically modern humans become the dominant type of human fossil. At that point, they begin to be found in, from Europe to Australia to the Far East. The sudden, sudden expansion seems to correlate with the dispersal from West, Western Asia. Soon after the expansion, the first striking examples of figurative arts, that is cave paintings and sculptured figurines, are recorded in Europe. Although I think they are finding that uh, some of them appear to be associated with Neanderthal and not hum uh, anatomically modern human, anyway, uh, fossils. 
This pattern of appearance of modern morphological traits has led to the out of Africa hypothesis, which posits that anatomically modern humans evolved in East Africa first and later spread to the rest of the world. The mosaic of morphological characteristics or characters apparent in most of the early anatomical modern humans could be explained by the existence of some admixture with pre existing human populations, such as Neanderthals in Europe, instead of total replacement. In other words, maybe uh, there are different uh, characteristics that are in, inherited from uh, one or the other parent, and um, there's really been quite a bit of admixture. Um, an alternative model, the multi-regional evolution theory, does not support the idea that anatomically modern humans originated in Africa. Instead, it suggests that the emergence of anatomical modernity was a gradual process involving more than one population at a time. These groups would have been living in different regions but could have still exchanged genes, contributing to the overall gradual modification of our species. Now, the significance of variability in morphological characters, hominid species are defined on the assumption that morphological variability reflects genetic differences significant enough to preclude interbreeding. That's the assumption. In other words, the species were so different from each other that they did not mix and produce offspring. If they mixed and produced offspring, it's really hard to call them different species. However, some traits may vary for reasons other than genetics, for example, behavior and climate. Moreover, some skeletal differences uh, that seem to imply biological discontinuity may be instead correlates of size or developmental stage or may simply reflect a larger amount of variability than that observed in modern humans. And he has a couple of standard references for that. Another complication with evolutionary reconstructions comes from the practice of assigning an order of appearance to morphological characters, defining some as ancestral or primitive and others as derived. The distribution of these characteristics does not always follow the expected pattern, and mosaic combinations occur where old fossils show modern traits or modern populations possess archaic traits. And there's another reference for that. Notwithstanding the difficulties in interpreting variability in morphological characters, it cannot be denied that anatomical modernity appears only at the very top of the human fossil record. Now, so far, he hasn't pre uh, uh, presented anything that can't be reasonably defended from the literature, and that um, that doesn't mean that all evolutionists would be happy with this presentation. For one thing, some would favor one or the other theory that he seems to uh, give, um, uh, that he seems not to be favoring as much as they would. And so what he's written it would be controversial, but not particularly controversial in the creation evolution kind of way. Strengths and weaknesses of the evolutionary model. Previous sections of this chapter illustrate how current thought regarding human evolution is far from resolved. And that's apparently admitted. How to evaluate the current weight of evidence is obviously a subjective matter, but the writer's personal view is that the case for human evolution based on the study of fossils is not a compelling one. Now, of course, he's, uh, those are them's fighting words. <coughs> um, in particular, a key transition, such as the one from Australopithecines to Homo, lacked adequate detailed support to be demonstrated unequivocally. Um, some people's view would be, you don't have to demonstrate unequivocally, it just has to be plausible. And uh, plausible will vary in the eye of the beholder, of course. On the other hand, the evolutionary model's major strength lies in the ordered distribution of fossils with Australopithecines occurring below Homo and anatomically modern humans appearing only at the top of Homo's stratigraphic range. And he notes that this is not just a problem for humans, if you're a creationist, but it's a problem everywhere. The ordered distributions of biological remains is a major feature of the fossil record. 
Um, actually, he doesn't mention that it's a problem. He just notes that it's, it's something that's there everywhere. Um, understanding the fossil rec evidence from a creationist perspective, the anatomical differences observed between Australopithecines and Homo are interpreted by most creationists as representing two separate and non-related primate groups. Australopithecines were a particular kind of ape. Humans are humans. The variability observed among different Homo species, however, is often interpreted as expressions of high original diversity and microevolution within the human group. And he cites Lubinow, who is probably the classic um, uh, creationist anthropologist. According to this approach, Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis, and other mosaic forms would be true representatives of the human species that at some point developed distinctive sets of morphological traits as a result of genetic changes and ecological factors. This interpretation implies that the modern aspect of humans became fixed only relatively recently out of a great range, a greater range at least, of morphological expressions. In fact, post-flood microevolutionary modifications are routinely invoked for other species like cats or canids and should not be categorically ruled out for humans. That is to say, if we have uh, concede that uh, English bulldogs and uh, dachshunds and uh, chihuahuas and Great Danes and uh, St. Bernards and German Shepherds are all evolved from the same general stock, um, well, you know, with some help, but then humans, of course, would have had some help too. Um, uh, then uh, some variation might be expected. Um, and so this kind of process should not be categorically ruled out for humans. Fixity of our species does not seem to be <coughs> supported by scriptural evidence. And indeed, most creationists even propose that physiological changes occurred to our species as a consequence of sin or modified ecological conditions after the flood. Um, we have a question here early on, but that's fine. So just I wanted to um, get your clarification on what the definition of a species is. So there's evidence that shows that the my mitochondrial DNA of Neander Neanderthals are within human DNA populations. Recent data suggested not in African but in European and Asian. So does that not imply that they're part of the same species? Well, you, you can find uh, people who will argue the opposite. Um, but certainly assuming that you're correct, um, I think that it's, that it's very arguable that uh, Neanderthals are, in fact, human in the most important senses of the word. And uh, the argument that they couldn't or wouldn't interbreed with uh, anatomically modern humans is, I think, a strained one. Uh, for one thing, if you see mosaic characteristics, or you see, you know, parts of one and parts of the other, um, you kind of would think that, uh, that that might be kind of almost prima facie evidence of interbreeding. Uh, so uh, I, I would agree that uh, the evidence from DNA is uh, at least equivocal and possibly suggestive. And uh, the evidence from morphology is probably also suggestive. Um, and from that point of view, from either an evolutionary or a creationist uh, uh, perspective, uh, it shouldn't be surprising that Neanderthals and humans would be able to interbreed. Uh, Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans, in which case they are humans, in which case we really should call them Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis instead of Homo Neanderthalensis. Um, 
The late appearance of anatomically modern humans might be related to a more recent dispersal of a hum human group in which anatomically modern traits were predominant. It is interesting to note that scripture allows for such suggestive migrations, for example, the post-flood dispersion, the post-tower of Babel dispersion, and that the biblical and part of the fossil record converge in placing Western Asia as the spreading center for these dispersions. And again, he has a reference for that now. That's where he finishes. My own uh, view on this is that I think in a very short space, he's done a really quite a good job. He has managed to survey the literature and make his case sound logical without what often happens sound, uh, being combative. And he's managed to do that in a very short space. He's left out the usual creationist talking points about Nebraska man, Piltdown man, Peking man, Java man, etc. On the other hand, such cases should not be completely forgotten for two reasons. Um, one of them is they do illustrate that uh, um, things that get the blessing of science are not necessarily as nailed down as they should be. Um, that as they would say in medicine, one study is no studies that you really need confirmation of a lot of this stuff, um, that we don't need to jump to conclusions based on uh, uh, one piece of evidence. Uh, sometimes they're misinterpreted, sometimes they're outright frauds, sometimes uh, uh, nobody really knows what happens to them. Uh, Peking man and Java man are no longer extant as I understand it. Um, Certainly, Peking man has been lost in the war. Now, Nalen has also left out the question of mosaics between humans and apes. There are creationist scientists who say that uh, perhaps before the flood or perhaps immediately afterwards that humans and apes had better genetic properties than they do now and that they could, in fact, interbreed and you could have half human, half apes. And some people have even proposed that, uh, that Australopithecus robustus is a human gorilla cross and that um, uh, Gracilis is a uh, chimpanzee human cross. Now, I'm not sure that he wanted to get into that, so I'm not, surprising that, I'm not surprised that, that he didn't uh, talk about it. It raises some very interesting questions as to what kinds of uh, critters those will turn out to be. Um, uh, there, is, there is one point that's probably important, and that is that if that's really the case, that you might even see a uh, uh, species with uh, varying degrees of uh, ape and human uh, uh, characteristics, uh, it's probably important uh, to keep in mind that when you really get down to brass tacks, it's very difficult uh, to absolutely rule out a creationist point of view, and it's also very difficult to rule out an ev evolutionary point of view. Uh, from an evolutionary point of view, the difficulty with finding the boundaries of be between species is actually positive because they want to say that you had something that could evolve into a chimpanzee and that gradually turned more and more and more human as time went on um, because that's classic evolution. Um, so I, I try not to make too much of a big deal about that because uh, certainly, I don't claim it as a, a creationist point, is that it's really hard to tell what's in what, and uh, all these people are talking out of, off of their hats. Well, their answer would be, well, of course it's hard to tell what is what, because in fact, they're evolving that way. Um, I, I don't view the human-ape relationship as definitive for the conflict in either way, if you can get uh, those kinds of crosses, uh, and by the way, I am told that in Russia, um, Stalin, in fact, uh, tried to make human gorilla crosses to get uh, creatures that were 
not too smart so that they could be ordered about, I guess, but really strong so they could be like, I don't know, sent down to the salt mines or something to, to do all the hard work that humans don't want to do. Um, as far as we know, it didn't work out. Now, there are some who need a definitive border for these are humans because then they have souls. Um, um, I, if you don't have a need for that definitive border, there's really very little at stake theologically. Uh, and I say that partly because it's not just uh, the, uh, the border. Uh, uh, the, the border problem doesn't disappear if you can separate cleanly between humans and apes. Um, the border problem is also there with uh, uh, people with varying degrees of uh, intelligence all the way down to anencephalics who have no brain whatsoever. Um, or perhaps have brain stem function, but that's all. Um, the, the important questions that I see in this whole conflict are number one, was God involved and can we tell? There are people who claim God was involved but we can't tell. Those are uh, what are now classically known as theistic evolutionists, although they never like the name they're given. Um, um, I think the most creative name I saw was Van Til who called it fully gifted creationist, which if that's um, uh, wouldn't meet truth in advertising, I don't think. Um, but the, uh, uh, the second one is, well, God was involved and we can tell, and of course that's classic intelligent design. Um, creationists are a subspecies of intelligent design, if I can put it that way. Uh, the, the second one is, how long did it take? And uh, that's really, if, if it was a short time, then all of this argument, no matter how, what kinds of forms you find, they just have to be stuffed into a creationist uh, point of view. If it's been a long time, then even if you're missing a whole bunch of evidence, well, it's just the fossil record is incomplete. And at least in this area, as opposed to some other areas where the fossil record is replete, such as the Cambrian explosion. Um, I think you can actually make that case. We just don't have very many hominid forms. And so the story that's being told is a little bit like a story of two dots, or three or four dots, like so. Now, is that a straight line? Is that a curve that goes like this? Is that a curve that goes up, down, up, and down? Or some other curve? You can take your pick. The data simply don't define or uh, don't uh, uh, harden the hypothesis enough. Now, the fit with evolution is partly artifactual. And by that I mean so we're all atomically modern. But some group has to wind up at the top. Why not us? So that I'm not sure that you can make quite as much a case of evolution for evolution as you would otherwise do. Uh, and the other thing is that there are a few uh, counter examples that are usually ignored. And I'm going to take as uh, my classic example the Laetoli footprints. Now, the radiometric age on these is 3.6 to 3.8 million years. This is well before most of the Australopithecines, in fact. Um, they're anatomically modern, and you'll see what I mean in just a little bit. Um, and I think the reason why that Nayland didn't want to deal with this is uh, very simple. As you're going to see, it takes a lot of space and photographs, really, and uh, to, to make the case. And 
photographs are, number one, they take space, but number two, it, it, they, it's a real pain in the neck um, to get uh, a photograph that either you can use because it's your own or because, or, uh, uh, or uh, to get permission to use it. Um, and you really need a lot of them. Um, fortunately, we are in an academic exception, since I'm not charging for you guys to sit here. Uh, otherwise, I'd probably have the same restrictions. Um, <clears throat> this is the trackway. As you can see, there's some things that look remarkably human going here. There's some other ones. They think that this is actually somebody following in somebody else's footprints. So these ones are not as clear, and uh, they may actually be double prints. Um, but the, the ones on the side are clearly human. Uh, you take a look at it, and you'll notice there's a couple of things I want you to pay attention to. One of them is the length of the big toe. It's almost as long as the second toe. It's right next to it. Uh, notice that you have a, a little bit of an arch here. Um, now, um, was <coughs> this is taken from a video. Um, by the way, the people who made this video argued for long ages. And um, as you can see, chimpanzees have this four toes here and this one thumb that's way out there. And it almost looks more like a hand than a foot. And uh, you can see this is clearly not a chimpanzee. Um, here is uh, the Laetoli print, and here is an anatomically modern uh, footprint taken from uh, apparently a crime scene. Somebody walking barefoot. And you can see that that, yeah, it could pass. Um, I have personally taken care of people who's big toe was separated enough from their second toe to where uh, you could easily make that, that uh, footprint. Um, uh, the next question that would ob obviously pop up is, well, what about Australopithecus? Do, don't we have any footprints? Well, it turns out we don't have very many foot bones. The closest I could get is Wikipedia, obviously uh, getting it from elsewhere. Uh, that has most of the f foot bones in um, uh, uh, an outline and a few of the bones actually there. And uh, I mean, you look at that and you look at this and there's no way. Now, maybe they're just making that too ape-like. I don't think we have any way of proving one way or the other. Um, on the other hand, I don't think Wikipedia is particularly biased in favor of creationism, so I don't think their reconstruction is likely to be a uh, uh, likely to be skewed towards uh, uh, making it anatomically uh, 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 impossible for a. Uh, uh, for an Australopithecine to have made that track. But if that's the case, then we have an interesting incident, in, instance of where apparently anatomically modern human footprints are found, different from Australopithecines, if, if the reconstruction is correct, that um, that predate most, if not all, of the Australopithecines. And in that case, we're probably looking at um, some pretty good evidence that, in fact, although we don't have any bones of anatomically modern humans back then, uh, there's evidence that they lived then. And um, of interest, this is another example where the footprints come before the animal. Um, uh, Triassic shorebirds apparently left 
some tracks well before birds appear in the fossil record. And um, there's a recent case of um, a tetrapod a, uh, amphibian that, show, that shows up in footprints well before amphibians are found in the fossil record in terms of uh, um, their uh, skeletal remains. Um, and uh, incidentally, predating the uh, supposed link, uh, Tikalek, that was hailed by many evolutionists as finally they found the fish, the almost amphibian fish. With that, I will uh, open up the floor for comments. <coughs> Got one here. This has been an interesting uh, controversy going on for a long time. <clears throat> I can recall in 1959 attending the uh, Darwin Centennial celebration, the, probably the largest one in the world at that time. It, it, uh, it was the uh, Origin of Species, 100 years of the publication of the Origin of Species. And, uh, not as bicentennial that we celebrated two or three years ago. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Louis Leakey was there. And uh, interestingly, uh, it's, he had just discovered Homo habilis. And uh, <clears throat> Actually, that discovery was after he had been invited to the Centennial to speak there, which is rather interesting and provided a, a great rejoicing that uh, we had this uh, serendipitous this, uh, addition to the conference and so on. Uh, the uh, literature that followed afterwards has been uh, a little bit equivocal on this, and as I recall, and I I'd have to check my book to make sure I have the right reference and so on, there's been a definite question of whether Homo habilis was really a member of the genus Homo. And the question uh, was along the line that Louis Leakey had to broaden out and stretch the definition of Homo in order to work in this uh, maverick Homo habilis, which has been, you know, it's been a question all the way through. It still is, you know, it is, uh, uh, you just pointed out that, uh, so here we have a case probably that uh, you could make a case, I think, that probably Homo habilis does not belong in the genus Homo. And I, I think this tends to support the, the general uh, conclusion that uh, above Homo habilis, uh, in your line up, uh, there is where man starts. Homo erectus, uh, and modern Homo sapien, so on. That's where the, the thing really starts. And uh, there's a good break there, even though it's the same genus. Uh, that was a genus, I think, that was expanded to fit the theory. I'm wondering about uh, how how we can combine combine the record found in the Bible with what we find in nature. Now, the Bible teaches, I believe, from beginning to end, that we have an image of God. Now, if we accept the evolutionary theory then my question is, what, if any, can we find in chimpanzees as to justify the image of God? Do chimpanzees have the image of God? Did they ever have a, an image of God? And what is the image of God? How do we understand the image of God? 
Well, for me, it's kind of interesting. Um, there are those who, of course, try to blur the line between chimpanzees and humans. Um, I'm reminded that perhaps 98% of humans, at least, maybe more, uh, could easily come to this room and discuss the pros and cons of uh, whether humans evolved from chimpanzees or not. Some would say they are, some would say they aren't. I think it's safe to say that 100% of chimpanzees could not sit in this room and carry on the same conversation, or even, as far as we can tell, understand it. I, uh, t to me, the, the idea that we're not really different is going against kind of the empirical evidence. Um, I am not aware even of chimpanzees talking about God. Um, I, in terms of language abilities, I think I probably have some parrots that can outdo the chimpanzees. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's tool making ability, yeah, but, um, Chimpanzees are not known to create aircraft carriers or even automobiles for that matter. Um, somewhere there's a disconnect here. Um, now, Australopithecines, we have no clue as to what they are able to do. Um, Uh, those creatures that walked across the uh, Laetoli uh, Lake before it uh, got filled in again with, uh, with ash. We don't know exactly how intelligent they were, um, but they certainly, they, their, uh, their anatomy appears to be way more human than it does uh, chimpanzee, probably given the limited of evidence that we have, it's way more human than it is uh, Australopithecine. Uh, my guess is that uh, those people were people who were intelligent enough to understand uh, about their situation, uh, able to understand other people, but they were more importantly able to understand. Um, about God and, and his uh, designs for their life and where they fell short of those designs. Um, and that's kind of where one has the responsibility. Um, we have a couple of other comments, so one back there and one here. Can Anyone I follow up before we sure. uh, go to some something else? Um, if chimpanzees do have the image of God or the possibility for having the image of God, then are they supposed to be redeemed? They, do they have the ability of sinning ag against the Creator and did Jesus die for chimpanzees, or did he die only for human beings? Well, that's not the subject that we started out with, but uh, my, my own view on that is that uh, Jesus died for the whole creation, that it's all corrupted. Now, whether individual chimpanzees will be raised in the judgment, I don't know. I doubt it, but I really don't have any way of proving. Um, would perhaps individual dogs be raised in the uh, judgment? I don't know. Um, again, I, I would say probably not, but uh, I might be surprised, and in some cases it would be a pleasant surprise. Um, 
there are there are animals whose friendship with humans makes you think that perhaps they are, they would be uh, eligible for the uh, new earth. Um, but I don't I don't know that we can answer that question without a definitive uh, divine answer, and 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 uh, I think otherwise we're kind of. Uh, left with speculation on that question. Uh, question back there, and then uh, if we can pass that mic over here, and then we'll get back to you as soon as he's done. Uh, the more you contemplate the flood, the more horrific it becomes. The destruction of all life is almost beyond contemplation. Ellen White gives an insight to that in saying the greatest reason for the flood was that amalgamation of man and beast theory. I think some of those strange forms that approach human characteristics could well be, again, the genetic experimenting they were doing then that distorted some some features. Uh, you might be right, and uh, I don't think anybody really knows if we ever find one in uh, uh, an, uh, permafrost in uh, in uh, northern Canada or, or Russia or something like that. We might be able to analyze its DNA and have a, a little better answer for that. Short of that, everything we say is really basically speculation. Now, the important thing is to know is that with those answers as possibilities, there is no real testable difference in the anthropology, I mean, uh, testable in the sense of completely falsifiable difference between the anthropology of an evolutionist and that of a creationist. And that's one of the reasons why I don't tend to use this as a, as a starting point. But I think that it, it's a question that has to be addressed because there are people from the other side who do use it as a, in, in, in my view, inappropriately, as a way of proving that evolution happened and therefore we need to give up Christian faith. Um, and I think that that's as I said, an inappropriate use of that data because I don't think it really supports it enough, if at all. There are apparently some, some traits uh, that, that uh, define humans apart from others that don't appear in the fossils, of course. And that is, I read an article that by uh, somebody who studies anatomy that um, the, um, the vocal apparatus in humans is wired to the thinking part of the brain. In chimps and all other, everything else below it, it's wired to the emotional part of the brain. Apparently, and that's a rather very dis, you know, striking difference. Apparently that's why when they try to have chimpanzees talk in you know, their simple way, they can't have them vocalize. They have to use other th sign language and things. Um, and there could be a lot of some other things like that that are yet to be understood. Um, I, I wonder about you know, why aren't there some, some uh, hu real human fossils along with some of these others? And I wonder if culture has anything to do with that. Uh, uh, a culture, you know, really intelligent human cultures, they might do things with their, with their dead that would not leave fossils, whereas these other things uh, don't. It's just a, a question. Well, it's interesting that most of these, both the anatomically modern humans and the others, are found in uh, um, kind of non-burial, uh, uh, or at least non-typical burial um, uh, positions. And, and uh, uh, th there is so little evidence to begin with and the evidence that we do have is, is, is not really definitive. We do find uh, Neanderthals apparently laid in typical burial positions. So at this point, um, we can say that at least those ones 
um, actually uh, did bury dead, uh, or pretty safely anyway. When you have you have a human and you have uh, iron oxide pigments uh, next to it, and the human is laid in a particular position that most people don't die in. Uh, it's it's pretty well uh, pretty reasonable to argue that at that point you're dealing with an actual burial, in which case Neanderthals are uh, human in all probability, just like the rest of us, and probably thought uh, probably if you put a Neanderthal in class, you could you know a few years teach him calculus. Um, uh, there's no particular reason uh, uh, to think otherwise. Um, but a lot of this stuff, we just don't have. A, it, it sounds wonderful until you start digging beneath the surface and you and you try to find out. Well, how much information do you have? You know, you think, well, we have lots of australopithecines, don't we? We should have lots of feet. Coming to find out, there all, aren't very many. What I showed you is close to all we know. Um, it would be really nice to have an osteopithecine foot and, and compare it with that uh, footprint. I suspect there'd be significant differences, but um, all we have is the, the bones we have and, and the reconstructions that people make from it, and then that's where we're stuck. Um, yeah. um, before we go on, I should mention it is now 11.30, and I know there's some people who have to go places, but uh, go ahead. Oh, just one comment. You, you talk about having a Neanderthal in class. Well, I, when I taught last year, last year, years ago, there was a student that I had in my classes who looked exactly like a Neanderthal. And uh, seemed to have heavy brow ridges. Big brow ridges, sloping forehead, I mean, the, the whole thing. And uh, he did He was a good student, did yeah. fine. And some of the ladies really liked him. So, uh, uh, so uh, the, the next question is, did he sign up for GEICO uh, for commercials? No, we, we, one of our teachers asked him why some of these ladies liked him so well. And he said, well, Neanderthal types are hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, my, we have a whole bunch of them here. Um, Let's go over to this side and then come over here and then uh, Ariel Roth. Well, I just have a simple question. That is, where is the Put it up. Where, where, where's the lake that the uh, footprints were found in? Where's that located? The Laetoli footprints? Yeah. It's found in East Africa, I think Tanzania, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, it was found by Mary Leakey. It was after apparently a rainstorm had washed a bunch of stuff out, and and here were these footprints that just appeared there, and uh, but they're in stone. Huh. You know, yeah. it's not like you could easily. Um, and it's interesting that although there's been a lot of criticism of Pilexi footprints, nobody, that, to my knowledge anyway, has taken those footprints and sawed them and seen whether the uh, they just accept it. <laughs> Um, it's interesting what you have to pass through and what you don't have to pass through, depending on what the footprints show. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think may be happening is that certain uh, fossils that don't show, uh, that don't support the uh, agenda, may simply kind of uh, disappear or at least be not discussed very much. There's a uh, woman in Guatemala that. Uh, is supposed to be encased in limestone of, that's supposed to be uh, something like 26 million years old. And of course, you get all kinds of arguments how this can't be, and therefore it must be a fraud. And, there's, um, and this is one of the problems, is that if you start using arguments that are, I mean, Laetole, they discovered. And that's probably why Ronnie Nalen's thing looks so uh, benign is because he's just simply re uh, recording what the standard literature says is okay. And 
of course, if you stick with that, you're not going to find anything that disproves a, a evolution because that's kind of out by almost definition. Um, there are uh, there are people around, uh, one of whom is a uh, Hindu, who believes that humans have been here for hundreds of millions of years, um, and says, well, here's one, and here's one, and here's one that, that are obviously out of place. But um, the evidence that he cites just kind of doesn't really show up very much because it doesn't fit the standard paradigm. Uh, for creationists, most of it, if not all of it, would be quite reasonable to believe in. Um, so we may be looking at selected data as well. Uh, selected by people who are in their own way well-meaning, but uh, selected nonetheless and therefore somewhat biased. Uh, we had a question down here. Um, My question is, uh, with some of these fossils that uh, seem to not be fully human, but to something pre-human, um, those of us that believe in creation and so on, has anyone tried to come up with an alternative explanation of where these fossils came from? Um, well, there, there are several things. Okay, suppose that originally there were four different kinds of, of uh, uh, primates, uh, or not primates, but um, hominids. So hominids. Uh, what do they call it? The ape family. Besides humans, chimpanzees and gorillas, and that one of them simply died out in Africa. You might very well, Australopithecine may be simply a particular kind of extinct ape, uh, no different than, let's say, the mammoths are from the elephants. Um, and um, that's actually a reasonable hypothesis. Uh, the um, Australopithecines weren't quite cut out to make it in Africa. Uh, they got down to small numbers and they got eaten by lions or leopards or whatever. Um, it's too dangerous to stay on the ground in Africa unless, you're, unless you've got some kind of cooperative to, to protect you. And uh, they didn't build houses and so, you know, uh, in, in, in differently from chimpanzees who sleep in trees, they were uh, subject to whatever was crawling around on the ground or walking around on the ground. And, you know, humans don't do too well with uh, fighting leopards, and neither did these creatures. Um, humans survive in Africa primarily because they're smart enough to build their own little protected place. And they're smart enough to be able to kill at a distance. Bows and arrows make a huge difference. Um, uh, chimpanzees do go, get around on the ground, but at night when it's time to sleep, they go up in the trees. So they were relatively protected. Um, maybe this creature couldn't and uh, therefore died out. I mean, as long as, we're t as long as we are allowed just those stories, that's as good a story as any. Um, the fact of the matter is we don't know. Um, on the other hand, could this be a cross between a human and a chimpanzee? There are creationists who've said, well, that's possible. Uh, some of whom, if they're Adventists, may even say this is because uh, the most base crime of this amalgamation between man and beast and reading it as between man and beast uh, rather, rather than of man and beast, which is ambiguous. Um, uh, that when we started to do this to the image of God, then we were uh, 
we were ripe for destruction by the flood. And that has interesting implications for now when we're starting to do genetic engineering and uh, do, uh, I guess you could say, you know, people are thinking about making designer humans. And if we do, maybe we will be messing with stuff that uh, will require God to pull things, uh, close things short again. That it's, it's only a matter of time whether hum when humans, either because of their innate brilliance and the ability to figure out stuff without having to experiment, or their ability to experiment and uh, make all of humanity into kind of parts of one giant brain, which is basically kind of what the internet's doing to us. Uh, and, uh, you know, the scholarly world already has its own interface, and now it has an interface at the speed of light. Um, that we're able to do things that God really doesn't want us to do. And it's time to close the, close the books on the whole show. Um, uh, you can make a case for that. And the fact of the matter is that nobody really knows. I, I think one of the bottom lines of this thing is, this is not a topic where the evidence so clearly shows that long ages and evolution are the right answer. That we should throw away our faith on the basis of uh, fossils that can be interpreted one way, can be interpreted another way. That there really isn't a good interpretation uh, that is unequivocally supported by the evidence that rules out um, a uh, short age creationist, let alone a Christian perspective. And Ariel. I just wanted to uh, raise the question a little bit about this concept that uh, is expressed that fully modern man is only found in the top layers. Now, I have not looked into this, uh, but uh, how do you correlate different deposits around the world? You can do it uh, possibly by radiometric dating. I'm sufficiently familiar with radiometric dating to know that it would be remarkable to have such a consistency, although the tendency seems to be definitely there. Uh, but such exact consistency is, is, is marginal, and uh, the widespread distribution, of course, is, uh, makes uh, lateral continuity impossible. Uh, in terms of correlation, so that I, I think uh, more study there would be interesting. I think so too. I think this whole thing could use more study, and it would be fascinating to uh, uh, fascinating to look at it. I don't think that this is an area where creationists need to sit and tremble, as you know, what are they going to discover next? And I think definitely you don't take this from the, uh, from the uh, newspaper headlines. As, uh, you know, my, my dad labored for 40 years under Piltdown Man. Turned out to be totally bogus. Nowadays, Every once in a while, you'll get somebody trumpeting a new human ancestor. Turns out it isn't even an ape. It's not a threat uh, to a creationist point of view. And um, it's hyping as a human ancestor is obviously uh, because people have figured out that if you get the media on your side, well, you might win the debate easier. And to my mind, that's kind of an almost anti-scientific position. Yes. You suggested that uh, Jesus probably died not only for human beings, but in order to, uh, in order to benefit the whole, the entire creation. Now, if we are talking in in general, I hope in heaven we'll have 
cats and dogs and horses and, and birds and fish because we love them. Yes, and, uh, and, and hopefully they'll be less likely to bite us on occasion. <laughs> okay, but as far as individual salvation, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, and then it is, that whoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So my question is, how can chimp a chimpanzee believe in order to be resurrected and have everlasting life? I, my sense is that probably chimpanzees don't. I have a little more question about uh, my parrot who said some other remarkable things and once asked if God wanted a kiss. And I'm not sure exactly how to answer that question theologically. Um, <laughs> you know, and I'm not sure how much the parrot's aware of it. Um, f on those questions, I can make my best educated guess, but I'm going to leave that up to God because I trust his judgment probably better than mine in this case. He knows a whole lot more. So, although I'll be happy to tell you my theory, I'll also say, quite frankly, that it's only a theory. Um, my own theory is in salvation you need two things. One, a recognition that you're not living up to the truth. And two, a recognition that God can help you. I don't even think you have to know about the name of Jesus, and I'll tell you why. Um, Jesus gave an example of two people, one of whom he said went home justified. Now that's the same word in the Greek that the Apostle Paul uses, and everybody heard about it, you know, justification by faith, righteousness by faith, yada, yada. So it's the same word. Okay. And this guy prayed a prayer, and it had two parts to it. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And so in that prayer, he is recognizing, one, I have fallen short of what I'm supposed to know. And two, God might be able to help me, and I can ask him. I don't even know that he knew for sure that God would help him. But the record says that having recognized those two things, he went home justified. Now, interestingly enough, he doesn't say anything about the coming Messiah, who presumably heard him. And he doesn't so, Jesus is a nice add-on, and if God is like Jesus, that gives us comfort. But I'm not sure it's totally necessary for salvation. It certainly wasn't necessary for the, this publican, who, tax collector, collaborator with the enemy, if you like, who, uh, who prayed. And... Uh, it doesn't appear to have been necessary even before that. Uh, if the sacrificial system was intended to point to Christ, it sure wasn't explicit. But I think it was intended to point out that we, one, have sinned, and two, need help beyond ourselves. And interestingly enough, those are the first two steps of the 12 step program. I cannot control my alcohol, my narcotics, my gambling, whatever. And number two, I ask for help from a higher power. And, and also interesting, somebody was telling, the, um, telling a member of AA, well, you know, if you just get rid of step number two, we can help the government help you. And the guy says, you don't understand. 
step two is <laughs> indispensable for the working of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I don't know whether chimpanzees or parrots or dogs or anything else like that understands that they have blown it according to standards of decency and honesty. And that they can't keep themselves straight by their own sheer willpower and that they have to ask God to help them. If they can, then I think individual chimpanzees or uh, parrots or whatever will be in heaven. If they cannot, then maybe God will make some that, uh, that will be sufficiently like them uh, to where we will still have companionship. And perhaps it is even arguable uh, that the ones we have in the new earth will have enough capabilities to where they will be more true companions. Perhaps the parrots can actually carry on intelligent discussions with us. Just a thought.